Good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Isn't it great to be part of the family of God? Mark said he was going to talk a lot about family this morning, so I'll copy him. Isn't it great to be part of the family of God, seeing new faces, hearing stories of uh, people being born in the natural, people being added to us in the spiritual. You know, last Sunday, if you were here, at the end of our gathering, two people gave their lives to Jesus and were baptized straight after the meeting. Uh, that, that means that this calendar year so far, we've seen five people give their lives to Jesus and be baptized. Mark and I are currently negotiating how many between us we're going to believe for for the year. Uh, his number's higher than mine, so I'm going to have to give in eventually. Uh, but if you're here today and you haven't been baptized in water, the pool is ready for you at the end of the gathering. Um, we also had the chance to pray for some folks who were sick uh, at the end of the gathering last week. Pray for a particular man who had a problem with his skin, and he texted me yesterday to say all week his skin has been improving. So we really want to thank God that he's a God who hears and answers prayer. He's a God who saves today. He's a God who heals today. And so if you've come here today and you don't know Jesus, this is the best place to come. If you've come here today and you've not been baptized in water, again, it's the best place to come. If you're sick in your body today, we don't want you to leave, we don't want you to leave without having the chance to pray for you because we believe that prayer makes a difference and Jesus makes people well. Amen? Now, all of that is by way of introduction. Forgive me. Would you open your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 6? Hebrews chapter 6. And it's been an exciting morning so far, being able to sing praises to God, being able to welcome in some new faces. It's been an exciting morning so far, being able to hear about some really exciting things that are happening in our near future with folks coming in to help us with the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. And uh, I trust that what I'm going to share with you this morning is also going to be exciting, but I also am well aware that um, when we talk about foundations, we're not only talking about something that goes out this way, but something that goes down deep into our lives. And so there is a certain sobriety, a certain seriousness with which I approach our subject this morning, which is the, the subject of repentance. And it's for this reason. I have <coughs> had, um, as I'm sure you've had, many opportunities to uh, share the good news with people over the years and lead people to Christ. And... Um, as I look around the room this morning, I'm probably kind of round about in the middle of the age and stage of life. So looking around, there's some of you have a lot less life experience than me, and there's some of you have a lot more life experience than me. But one thing that I've definitely found, and one thing I certainly found in the six or seven years where um, my main responsibility here was doing outreach into the student community of Cardiff, what I found again and again was that when people gave their lives to Jesus, if a foundation of repentance hadn't been laid in their lives they didn't last very long. And I say that with some sadness, and I say that with some sobriety. Um, but I found that if people didn't really grab hold of repentance, then the emotional decision that they'd made, or the excited decision that they'd made, or the decision that they'd made to go in with their friends who are Christians, uh, or respond to something supernatural that had happened in their lives that they couldn't explain, if the foundation of repentance wasn't laid in their lives, they didn't last very long. And at the same time, the people I know who have laid a foundation of repentance in their lives, it might have been difficult, it might have taken a long time, it might have involved numbers of conversations and prayer, they're still going on very, very well with God. And so I approach this this morning with, um, with an absolute confidence that this is the right thing for us to be looking at today. Uh, first of all, because God put it first in his list but also because I believe that as we dig down deep into the roots of our lives and lay into our lives what God wants us to do, it'll always produce the fruit that God intends. So Hebrews chapter 6 is where we're going to begin this morning, and I'm going to read from the New International Version of the Bible, and I'm going to read from verse 1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, Instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. Now, immediately, we are, we're, we're confronted with what I think is a really unusual word. And in particular, it's a really unusual word for our contemporary culture. You know, there are, there are stacks and stacks of phrases and stacks and stacks of words from our Bible that people who don't know anything about God use all the time. This week I heard someone say uh, in my hearing, oh, that person, they're the salt of the earth. Not even realizing that they're actually using the words of Jesus himself from Matthew chapter five. Other people talk about turning the other cheek 
if they're offended. Again, not, not realizing that those are the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. People, when they come to their neighbor's rescue or help out a, a damsel in distress, are often called a good Samaritan. Not even realizing that that's a story that Jesus actually told to help us understand how we love our neighbor. But I don't hear many people in contemporary culture. I don't hear many people on the school run or at the water cooler at work. I don't hear many people on Zoom or Teams or in emails talking about repentance. Do you? I didn't think so. It's not a common word in our contemporary culture because it's not a common value in our contemporary culture. So we have to, we're going to spend a little bit of time defining the word and then I'm going to show you what it looks like. You see, the word repent or the word repentance is a Greek word, metanoia, M-E-T-A-N-O-I-A. So it's not going to fit into Wordle, I'm afraid, but it might fit into a crossword. (laughs) Metanoia, which means to change your mind or to change your purpose. Okay, repentance means to change your mind. And therefore, this foundation of repentance from dead works is all to do with the decision you make not an emotion you feel. Repentance is a decision, not an emotion. It's a decision of the will. It's not an emotion you feel in your heart. Now, you might have come to faith in Jesus in a very emotional state. You might have been overwhelmed with his love for you. You might have cried tears of genuine gratitude that he would die for you. You might have Come to Jesus in unexpressible joy, having a great realization of his love for you. That's all well and good. But your, your repentance was not an emotion that you felt as a result of that. It was a decision you made that from now on, I am going to change the way I think. I am going to change my whole focus of life. I'm going to live for Jesus. It's a change of mind. Now, it's not just a theoretical, philosophical, intellectual change of mind. What does the writer to the Hebrews say? He says that the foundation is a repentance from acts that lead to death. In other words, repentance is a change of mind that actually leads to a different change of life. Which is why, very practically for so many of us, when we became Christians, we stopped doing certain things. Not because Christianity is to do with behavior management. It's not. God is interested in what you believe. He's interested in what you think, which is why come to the seminar tomorrow night. We're going to talk about the renewing of the mind. Because if God can change the way you think, if he can change the way you believe, he knows for certain that you'll live differently. So repentance is a change of mind. It's a decision, not an emotion. And it involves a subsequent change in behavior. If you don't like change, you're not going to like repentance. (laughs) On our wedding day, um, Saskia and I actually got married here in this building uh, nearly 16 years ago. Uh, We invited all our friends, we invited all our family, we invited all my parents, friends. We had folks flying from all around the world who were really, really excited about this day of getting married. And uh, we had a particular gentleman come to to, to give an address at our wedding. We were really excited for what's the word he's going to bring us for our marriage. And, you know, know, sitting there kind of slightly puffed up, ready to, you know, hear some great word about how, you know, together we're going to change the nations or we're going to, you know, know, save Asia single-handedly or, you know, be the best or whatever. I don't know what it was. And, um, and this gentleman came, and he came to share the word of God with us, and he looked at me and said, James, for you, in your married life, you're going to have to learn to say I was wrong. <laughs> and to say to your wife, you were right. In front of oh, oh, hundreds, of, hundreds of friends and family, he said, this is going to be the key for you in your married life, James. You're going to have to learn to say I was wrong, and you were right. Now, I can testify that that was the word of the Lord. <laughs> And although my wife has occasionally been wrong, (laughs) I have definitely been wrong a lot more. But I learned from that day on that for me to be a success in what God had for me in my life, I had to learn to be willing to change. I had to learn to be willing to change. I'm not talking about compromise. I'm not talking about being double-minded. I'm talking about being willing to receive correction or instruction or improvement on what I currently know and understand. And if you come to the seminar tomorrow night, we'll talk about how that's all a big part of repentance too. But let's look at our favorite person. Let's talk about Jesus. Turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Because although repentance 
is a word that is foreign to most modern ears. Uh, it was not a foreign term to the people of Jesus' day. It might be foreign for us. It might be something that we don't really understand in our contemporary culture. It's certainly something that's unique to the Christian faith, but it's, it was not uncommon to, to Jesus' hearers. So we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at what Jesus said and did with repentance. Because I believe it's always best to begin with Jesus. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Mark 1, verse 14 says this. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, let's remind ourselves, repentance is a change of mind that's going to lead to change in how you live. It's a decision, not an emotion, and it's going to lead to different acts, different behavior. And repentance was right at the start and right at the heart of Jesus' message and ministry. This is his first recorded sermon in Mark's gospel. It's very similar to the first recorded sermon in Matthew's gospel too. And he stands up and he says, the time has come, the kingdom of God is here. The rule and reign of God is right now. Okay, I'm going to show it to you by healing the sick and raising the dead. And your response is, change the way you think. So that you can change the way you live. Come and believe the good news. Repentance was right at the start and right at the heart of Jesus' message and ministry. Let's look at Matthew chapter 11. We're going to look at just a couple of times when Jesus talks about this. Uh, I find this next one particularly challenging. I'm sure you will too. Matthew chapter 11. We all know that I can't preach a message here without referring to Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 11. Uh, Once again, it's lovely to hear those pages turning. Matthew 11 verse 20, Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. What a provoking little scripture. What a little provoking turn of phrase from the Son of God. You see, Jesus wanted his hearers to repent. In fact, he expected his hearers to repent and his miracles were signs pointing people to the fact that they needed to repent. And I think this is very important for us, even in conversations with some, some people this week of the last few weeks. I know there's a great hunger among us for more and more signs and wonders and miracles. There's a greater hunger. There are gr- people who are involved in different um, ministries where they're not only praying for people in, in buildings like this, but in homes and on the streets. And it's fantastic. But we also must make sure that we're doing this in the same way that Jesus wanted to do. A healing, a miracle, a deliverance is in order that someone may hear the good news and repent. Not so that they can be sent on their way, better off physically, but still doomed eternally. That's why we're laboring this point this morning. We want to see healing. We want to see miracles. We want to see deliverance. We want to see restoration. And we want to see all of those things in order that people may know that there's a God, turn to him in repentance and faith, and receive eternal life. Amen? Amen. Jesus expected that the miracles he performed would lead people to repentance. One more, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. We are going to look at lots of scriptures this morning, so we'll be praying for paper cuts at the end of the meeting. (laughs) Jesus expected his miracles he performed to lead people to repentance. Why? Because God's kindness, Romans 2 verse 4, leads men to repentance. Okay, God's kindness. Luke 24, uh, this is an Easter Sunday scripture, so I'm a week early. Um, but this is one of, this, one of the statements Jesus makes after he's been raised from the dead. Luke 24, verse 46, Jesus says to the disciples, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Jesus, having been raised from the dead, woo, he tells his disciples what's going to happen next. And Jesus expected his disciples and Jesus expects us 
to continue to take his message to the world. What's his message? Repentance and forgiveness of sins. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But Jesus didn't, it wasn't that when Jesus went back to heaven that the message of repentance stopped. It's carried on by the church. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. Let's have a look a couple of, for a couple of minutes at what the church in Acts did. Acts chapter 2. These disciples had been with Jesus for three and a half years. They'd walked with him, they'd talked with him, they'd worked with him, they'd served him. They'd seen him after he'd been raised from the dead. In Acts chapter 2, they, they're together all in one place, and 120 of them, all together in one place, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> they go out into the city of Jerusalem. They're speaking in new languages, declaring the praises of God. Peter's explaining to everybody, no, they're not drunk. This is what God promised through the prophet Joel. And so the crowd are cut to the heart. And it says in Acts 2, verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What must we do? They say in verse 37. Brothers, what must we do? Not what could we do. What are the options? What must we do? And Peter responds with a must. You must repent. Okay, Repentance is not a maybe, it's a must. It's not an option, it's the only way. This is emphasized by Acts 17 as well. Turn with me there. Acts 17, verse 30. Just in case you think it might have just been for the day of Pentecost. Acts 17, verse 30. This is Paul speaking in Athens at the Oropagus on Mars Hill. Acts 17, verse 30. Paul says, In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Repentance is a universal command. He commands all people everywhere. It works in all time zones. It works in every language. This principle of changing our minds, turning to God, works everywhere. Every one of us repent, who's a member of this church, we repented and put our faith in Jesus, didn't we? And in order to become a Christian, that's what you need to do. You repent and put your faith in Jesus. It's a universal command. It's not an option. It's for everyone. And turn over to Acts chapter 20. Repentance is so important. The Bible gives us an image that helps us understand its real significance, its real power, and that's of turning. Turning. Okay, so often the Bible will talk about repentance as an act of turning. Okay, just as you were going this way, then you repent and you turn the other way. So Acts 20 verse 21, or Acts 20 verse 20, sorry, says this. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but I've taught you publicly from house to house, verse 21, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. So repentance is a radical change in our lives. You and I were going, the other, we were going this way. We were going away from God. And then we turned to God in repentance. Okay? I wasn't a nice person who got improved by Christianity. <laughs> That's why they, in our baptistry out, out, out in the foyer, it doesn't say the old is improved. It says the old is gone. The new has come. Christianity isn't improving sinners. <laughs> it's a complete change. I was walking away from God. Some of us were younger, some of us were older, some of us were adults, some of us were children. Some of us had never heard of Jesus before, some of us had heard of Jesus every day in our lives, but at some point we realized that we were going this way, we were going this way, we were going this way, and eventually we were going to fall if we kept going that way. But we turned to God. And how did we turn to God? In repentance. We changed our minds so that we would change our path of life. I can't talk about faith because that's another foundation for someone else. 
But this is nice, James. Okay, but this is all one side of the coin. What actually happens when we repent? Well, let's go back to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. What happens when we repent? And this is where repentance is so countercultural. This is where repentance is a value right at the heart of the kingdom of God that is not found at all in the kingdom of this world. Because what happens when we repent, this is what happens every time. Every time we repent, we are forgiven. Every time. So the moment you became a Christian, you put your faith in Jesus, as we're going to see in a second, you were forgiven. Should I ever sin as a Christian afterwards? And I again come to God in repentance. Guess what he does? He forgives me. And then we can work this principle into our relationships with one another. Should I wrong Mark and I come to him and ask him for forgiveness? I repent and ask him for forgiveness. He is going to forgive me. What happens when we repent? You are forgiven. How do I know? Luke 24, verse 47. Luke 24. We've read it already. Maybe you didn't pick it up this time. Okay. What are we preaching? Repentance and forgiveness of sins. They go hand in hand. It's like left hand, right hand. Okay. The result of repentance is that you are forgiven. I am so certain of this from the word of God. It's not a possible, it's not a maybe. When we come to God and repent, he forgives. Straight away. You're not put on probation for six months. We don't believe in um, purgatory. We don't believe in absolute, uh, in um, what's the penance. We believe in instant and available forgiveness. Let's just take a moment. Let's just let that just let sink into your conscious system right now. You Christians in this room this morning, when you turned to Jesus, when you repented, he forgave you. He forgave you. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness means to cease to blame or hold resentment against someone or something. Forgiveness means to grant a pardon for a mistake or a wrongdoing. Forgiveness means to free someone from the obligation of a debt or a payment. Let me read that again. Forgiveness, this is the Collins English Dictionary, means to cease to blame or hold resentment against someone or something. It means to grant a pardon for a mistake or wrongdoing. It means to free someone from the obligation of a debt or a payment. And that's what God did for us when we repented. He ceased to blame us or hold anything against us because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He granted us a pardon. We were in the court of heaven, guilty, and because we repented and put our trust in Jesus, he declared us innocent. He said, you are no longer in debt to me because I've paid all your debts. This is right at the heart of the commitment, the agreement that God has made with us as a result of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. Now, I know we're looking at lots of scriptures this morning, but it's better to read the word than hear my voice. Hebrews chapter 8, please. Hebrews chapter 8. Because I want to show you what biblical forgiveness looks like. Because right at the heart of the commitment, the agreement, what the Bible calls the covenant that God has made with us as a result of Jesus' death on the cross is this promise, is this commitment to forgive. In fact, the new covenant, the commitment, the new agreement that we've come into with God is no longer a sin-conscious covenant because of the work of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8 It says this, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. 
No longer will a man teach his neighbour or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. What does godly, biblical, Christian forgiveness look like? When we come to God and we have repented, we change our minds, we are honest, we've fessed up to the mistakes we've made and we come to him and we ask for forgiveness. What does God do? There are two things that he does and if he does them, we can do them. The first thing he does is this, he forgives. He no longer counts you guilty. He removes the debt. He says, I forgive you. And then this is what he does as well. He forgets. He chooses not to remember it anymore. There's a subtle lie in our world today where people say, well, I can forgive them, but I can't forget. That's, oh, I, that's, that's an evil. God, this is God's way of forgiveness. I will forgive them and I'll remember it no more. I'll forgive them, I'll remember it no more. God is not going to call you to account tomorrow morning at nine o'clock and say, hey, remember that 15 years ago when you said that word you shouldn't have said? He's chosen to remember it no more. My friends, are you remembering things about your past today that Jesus has forgotten? Maybe you need to set yourselves free. Are you remembering something about your past today that Jesus has forgotten? Maybe you need to set yourselves free. You see, love, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5, keeps no record of wrongs. Now, what happens then? What are the results of forgiveness? I want to give you two really quickly. Two really quickly. Romans chapter 4, please. This is where the good news gets really good. (laughs) I want to suggest to you today two results of being forgiven. They're really simple. Joy and peace. I heard a preacher say one time that forgiveness is fun stretched out. I understand what he means by that. We're going to see a story in a moment about how, uh, what celebration comes when there's true repentance and forgiveness. But I know that repentance is a decision of the will. But it leads to wonderful emotions in our lives. It leads to joy and peace. Romans chapter 4 verse 7 says this. Romans chapter 4 verse 7. Blessed or happy are they whose sins are forgiven whose transgressions are covered. Happy is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. Have you entered into that joy today, my friends? That the Lord has forgiven you. Hallelujah. Have you entered into that joy today? I get so excited, Lord, every time I realize I'm forgiven. I forgive. I have made some absolute howlers in my life, and I'm sure you have too. I have said some stupid things. I've done some idiotic things. I've hurt people I should never have hurt. And I've come to God. I've gone to them. We'll come to that in a second. But I've gone to God and asked him for forgiveness. And do you know what? He's forgiven me. <laughs> and he doesn't count it against me any longer. Hallelujah. Genuinely forgiven people. People who know they're genuinely forgiven, rather are a happy people. Because it leads to peace. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, justified means we've been declared righteous, we're no longer guilty. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand this, dear friends? A Christian is at peace with God. When you woke up this morning, God was not angry that you slept through your alarm. He wasn't, he wasn't, oh, you, you, you sinned so many times in your sleep. No. You went to sleep in peace, you woke up in peace. God is the, you're at peace with God. You're at peace with God. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Our world is very, very short on forgiveness. Our world is very short on forgiveness. Has long memories Long, long memories of big hurts. But we are a counterculture in the middle of this world because repentance has been laid in our lives as a foundation. 
And so forgiveness flows from us like water down a mountain. Okay, so what does this all look like? These are, these are nice definitions. Show me what it looks like. I'd love to. Let's look at a story that Jesus told that illustrates this point. Luke chapter 15. I've given you some definitions. I've given you some text. Now let's show you a story that helps us see the foundation of repentance and the results of forgiveness through the eyes of Jesus. It's a long story, but I don't think you'll mind it. It's a very famous story. It's a story that even people in the world will have heard of. If you've got a Bible, I'd love you to look at it. I'm going to read the whole story so I can see some of you have got a Bible, some of you haven't. I'd like you to look at this text if you can. This is a great story. And of course, we're majoring mostly today into our relationship with, with God, how repentance affects our relationship with God. We'll come on to some things just at the end of the story about how it reflects our relationship with one another as well. But this is a story that Jesus told to the Pharisees because they were offended that tax collectors, tax collectors and sinners were gathering around Jesus. Verse 11 of Luke 15. Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. A long story, but a significant one. Both the previous two parables, Jesus had told the Pharisees and teachers of the law, which included morals about sinners repenting and heaven rejoicing. Now in this story, the younger son dishonors his father and some people interpret his request for an inheritance as him wishing his father to be dead. And the younger son not only leaves his father's presence, but he also wastes his inheritance in wild living. And finding himself in the humiliating situation of now being a hired hand feeding pigs, the lowest of the low, the son comes to his senses. He, has a, he comes to his senses. And what happens? He recognizes the state he's in. He recognizes the state he's in and he realizes that he must first of all return to his father. He has to admit his wrongdoing, which he says has affected both God and man. I've sinned against heaven and against you. And he realizes that he must accept the consequences. That's the son. He is not 
thinking, ah, it's all going to be fine. Dad's going to kill the fat calf when I get back. We know that, but he doesn't. The son is there going, I am in trouble here. I need to change. I need to change the way I'm thinking. I need to change the way I'm living. I have to return to the father. I have to admit my wrongdoing, and I have to accept the consequences. And for him, the consequences were I might never be a son again. But <laughs> look at the response from the father. The father, out in the field, sees his son. He has compassion for him. He runs to him. He embraces him. He restores him and he insists on celebrating. And that's what God did when you repented. That's what God did when you turned to him and came towards him. That's what God did when you put your trust in him. Okay? He's not merely a, he's not an accountant in heaven just kind of ticking off lists of, well, we've got another new member this morning, praise God. It's Mark, great, we've got him in, we've got Andrew in, yeah, we've got Olive in, great. Okay? No, he's a father who is delighted to have children in his home. He saw you coming, he heard you repenting, and he came towards you with all of his love, all of his grace, all of his mercy, and all of his forgiveness. And he says, we need to celebrate. But the Father did more than that, and God does more than that today. He not only wants to reconcile himself to us and us to him, he wants to reconcile us to one another. And so the brother is out in the field going, I don't want anything to do with this. I don't want anything to do with him. In fact, what does the brother say? This son of yours. He never calls him brother. He just says, this son of yours. This son of yours. This son of yours. But the father says, we had to celebrate. We had to. (laughs) We had to celebrate because your brother was dead but he's now alive again. He was lost, but now is found. You see, how we view repentance and how we receive forgiveness will affect not only how we view God and how we relate to God, it'll also affect how we view and relate to one another. This is the heart of God towards those who come to him in repentance. Do you see that for yourselves today? I can't whip it up in, in, in euphoria. I can't hype it up in terms of excitement. Do you understand, have you received into your spirit today, that when you turn to God, when anyone turns to God, he welcomes them just like the prodigal son's father welcomed him home. We have to see that, friends, because we are the, we are the representation of God in the earth. And so if this is how the Lord welcomes sinners into his kingdom. That's how we welcome sinners into our family. We're the Christ that the world sees. So how do we finish this today? How do we take this forward? Well, this is only possible through repentance. Restoration into right relationship with God and right relationship with people only comes through repentance and forgiveness. So this morning, I'm going to offer you three doors three doors, and I know that everybody in this room can walk through at least one of them. Okay? You might be able to walk through more than one of them, but I'm going to give you three doors. The first door are for those of you who've come here this morning and you have never before put your faith in Jesus. You're not currently a Christian. You have never repented. And the door that I'd love you to walk through is, as I read to you from Acts chapter 2, verse 38, repent And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if you've come here today and you have never before given your life to Jesus, you can do that today. Watching on the screen or listening to us in the future, you can do that today. If you do it on the screen, come and see us next week. But if you've never done that today, young and old, male and female, whoever you are, today you can repent, be baptized and receive the forgiveness of your sins. If you have done that, 
But as you've listened to the message this morning, as you've been in the gathering today, you're well aware, do you know there's something in my life that I actually need to ask God for forgiveness of as a Christian? Maybe an attitude that you've had, something this week that you've said or done that you shouldn't have. Maybe, maybe a sin in your life that the Holy Spirit's been putting his finger on and you've been putting your finger in your ears. I've got another door for you to walk through. It's found in 1 John chapter 1. And it says this in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus' his son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If that's what you need to do today, you can do that. We're going to sing to the Lord in a moment and as Josh leads us in a song, you can just come to the Lord where you are. You don't have to come through me. You don't have to come through anybody else. You can simply come to the Lord, believer, and you can say, Lord, I know you've been putting your finger on this in my life. I confess it to you. I ask you to forgive me. And he'll cleanse you and purify you. And you'll know fresh fillings of that joy and peace that we talked about before. But you might be sitting here today going, James, that's great, but I don't need to walk through that door. Fantastic, I've got another door for you. Because this news is too good to keep to ourselves, isn't it? This is the only worldview that offers forgiveness. Yes. That's true. Christianity offers you forgiveness. Yes. Yes. Our contemporary culture is not quick to forgive. Just open your Sunday paper today and see which politician or which celebrity has been hanging out to dry for a past mistake that they'll never be forgiven of. But there's no sin that God can't forgive. For us then, those of us who are in right relationship with God today, we know we've got nothing we need to bring to him. Let's walk through this door from Luke 24. Verse 46, I've read it to you twice already. This is what was written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name. For those of us who know we're walking in right relationship with God, we've got nothing to repent of to him, then let's take this good news this week and let's share it with someone who needs to hear it, who's never repented, who's never received Jesus, and they can join us in our Father's kingdom.